Pepperologists. This is with a world community of Pepperologists that probably doesn't top 200. Something like 6,000 new texts have been entered. Tens of thousands of discrete edits have been committed. We've added Coptic. We're working towards adding Demotic Egyptian and Arabic. The Duke Data Bank now has an editorial board, and it contains a dozen international papyrologists, some of whom are even graduate students and do an excellent job. Find me a peer-reviewed scholarly journal, uh, of 25% um, of whose editorial board consists of graduate students. Grad students in Michigan and Berkeley and elsewhere are now regularly publishing directly to the Duke Data Bank emendations to editions made by some of the world's best papyrologists ever. Um, a dedicated group of undergrads at BYU have organized to translate the largest archive of papyrological documents direct to the system. One of our most um, uh, active contributors is a retired high school teacher who's found a second intellectual life entering texts in the Duke Data Bank um, and who wrote me to warn me that he was going to have a quadruple, quadruple bypass and wouldn't be entering texts for 30 days. On day 31, I got an email from him saying, I'm back. <laughs> and he was. Um, um, uh, other projects like Pelagios are leveraging the geodata that we expose. The Trismegistus project has built an onomastic and prosopographic project around our data. And even a preliminary and complete, uh, um, uh, completely new browse interface for the Duke Data Bank, um, which would be great if it actually put us out of business. Parts of the underlying code are being repurposed under an experiment by the Perseus Digital Library. We're working with other non-classics projects um, who are looking like they're going to do the same. It is still early days, but in a number of ways, I think it's fair to say um, uh, that we've had some success. So in keeping with the spirit of the project, uh, or of the, the title of the panel, Getting Started with Classics, we thought we'd offer a few lessons that we learned along the way, uh, some of them the hard way, some of them through failure, but all of them, we hope, uh, useful to others. Um, and from there, move on to some theoretical implications of these lessons, and then to conclude. So I'll hand off now to my colleague, Hugh Kalis, who is somewhere up here. So uh, I finally got into my hotel room at about 4.30 this morning, which coincidentally is about the time I normally get up. Um, so if I fall over, that's why. Um, yeah, Josh will catch me and prop me back up again. Um, so, Axiom. You can't do it all yourself. Digital Classics is rarely going to be a one-person show. Mastering both the scholarly and the technical, which is itself often scholarly sides of a project, is usually going to be more than you can handle alone. You need help. Finding that help is the real trick. Don't assume that you can just get funding, go and find a tech person, um, have them do the digital bits and you just do the scholarship, um, really any more than you'd expect to rent an archeologist uh, or a historian or a Latinist for a project. You should start by doing what you can by yourself anyway. You might be lucky and already have a support system in place for doing digital projects. Most people don't though. So, you can sketch out what you want to build. You can learn a bit of HTML and JavaScript and build a mock-up. You can think through some of the mechanics yourself. You'll find it a lot easier to find collaborators and funding if you can demonstrate the power of your idea. And people will understand what you're talking about much faster and much better if they can see examples. Be patient. It takes time to build up a team of collaborators. It will take longer than you expect to do any project of significance. If you go out for funding, you might not be successful the first time. Don't give up, but do solicit and pay attention to criticism. For example, the NEH gives out startup grants of up to $60,000 to get projects off the ground. Now, I've applied to this program both successfully and unsuccessfully, and I've sat on a review panel for it as well. I've seen virtually the same proposal, seriously, like a few word changes, rejected one year and then accepted the next. I've also seen good projects, uh, good proposals torpedoed by one bad review or reviewer more than once. So sometimes you won't get funded just because of bad luck. Sometimes a proposal will have fixable problems and the reviewer's comments will help you to fix them. So try again if you don't succeed. 
Programming is not a magical activity, and programmers are not wizards. They are so they also are not plumbers, but holding the technical aspects of a project at arm's length is always a recipe for failure. You might do this because you feel technically incompetent and unable to understand what the programmers do, um, or because you think programmers are merely implementing your ideas. But the fact is, the developers are smart enough to understand what you want, and you are smart enough to understand what they do. And really, mostly, this just means talking to each other a lot. Your project will never be done. Unlike some traditional scholarly activities, uh, such as monograph and article publishing, for example, digital projects can always be improved upon. And there's not a set point where you hand them over to somebody else's care. That doesn't mean you can never stop working on them, but it does mean you should think about how to leave them so that someone else may pick them up later on. The data that's produced might be useful to someone else. The code that's written might be reusable. The ways in which you solve problems or fail to solve problems might inspire further work. The goal is to publish your work so that this is possible. You should think of yourself more as a stonemason working on part of a cathedral. That is a project that will go on for generations, rather than a painter producing a picture. You should be a techno-realist, not a techno-utopian. Digital methods and tools are probably not going to change the essential character of your teaching and research, not in the short term, anyway. They can, however, make certain tasks go much faster allow you to reach many more people, allow you to present your work in new ways. They won't, though, make you any smarter. They won't do the intellectual lifting for you. They won't erase ambiguity and complexity. Hard tasks are still going to be hard. Occasionally, you do run across a case where technology can revolutionize the way you work. So you can think about the effects of full text searching on classics research. Um, we don't produce those giant um, uh, codices of, of, uh, of con concordances of Ovid, for example, anymore. The environment isn't a static thing. The technology landscape in which your project operates isn't fixed. It will change in ways both good and bad. And you need to be aware of it, and to be aware that you can change it yourself for the better. Standards like the TEI, for example, can be changed to suit you if you run into a problem it doesn't address, or doesn't address well. Projects that were done may need to be redone, or made better. Systems that worked may stop working if you upgrade components. Ideas that wouldn't have worked in years past may be achievable now, all because of changes in technology. The environment does, however, and should, a good thing constrain you. You will, if you haven't already, hear the maxim, don't reinvent the wheel. This is facile. Um, and may or may not actually be true in your specific case. Sometimes you do want to reinvent it. But it does contain a useful point, namely that you should avoid where you can inventing new stuff. Because any new thing is going to have to plug into a complex environment. An environment that includes not just software, but standards, users, developers, institutions, and other projects. It's going to have to adapt and evolve to fit into that environment. You aren't just going to get it right first time and move on. This means developing any really new thing is usually going to be much harder and take much longer than you expect. And it will also carry much greater risk. That's not to say don't invent, but rather be strategic about it and use available standards, software, and methods whenever you can. Dream large, but build small. So Gall's law, um, so-called, states that a complex system that works is invariably found to evolve from a simple system that worked. The inverse proposition also appears to be true. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be made to work. You have to start over, beginning with a working simple system. Small, individually useful pieces make for better systems and are useful outside the context in which they were built. These pieces don't have to be code. 
They can be methods, theories, documents, so text files, images, and so on. And finally, set your work free. Sometimes people are hesitant to give away their digital work, but there are good reasons not to restrict the uses that other people can make of it. Given the fast-moving nature of technological development, there's going to be a relatively short period during which your work will be most useful. If you don't plan to sell it, there's no benefit to you in preventing commercial uses of it, for example. Your project can almost certainly only succeed by reusing the work of others. So you must realize that it's important to enable others to use your work too. Moreover, if there's no predetermined end to your project, it becomes important that it can live on after you or after you're interested in working on it. There's a whole ecosystem dedicated to the responsible management of copyright for digital artifacts, code, etc. One of the main players in this ecosystem is called Creative Commons. It provides licenses you can attach to digital content to make it clear to potential users what they can and cannot do with your stuff. Open, non-restrictive licenses like CC attribution will enable the collaborators that you haven't met yet to make good use of your work. Really, 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 please avoid the more restrictive licenses. Don't put non-commercial on your licenses. These practical maxims aren't just development guidelines, but the underpinnings of a broader theoretical framework, as our colleague Ryan is going to talk about. Okay, we're going to kind of tie some of those earlier maxims into a part of theoretical framework as you intoned. Uh, in digital humanities, the theory is the substance. Design is the substance. Uh, the substance is code and data, and vice versa. There's no partition between them. We think about things in terms of a graph because we have a graph. We think about things in terms of big data because we have big data. Theory determines the very things you're even able to think about and discuss. I don't think this thing is new or unique to the age. There are distinct parallels in physics, philosophy of science, and other disciplines. I call it physics because philosophy of science uh, similarly uses physics as a benchmark for reality or a serious discipline. The age is definitely the intersection of digital and humanities. So tools are theory, data is theory, but the humanities have their own theories as well. Uh, there can be friction when these theories and models don't match. That's expected. But that, can, but that doesn't mean that we have to resolve that friction by allowing just one theory to prevail. I believe digital humanities can be richer when we resolve this friction by revising theories. Uh, moreover, this process is what allows digital humanities to exist as a thing with its own theories. Not a suspension or emotion of theories, but a solution. By such an approach, we can also progress by evolutionary means, the mixing, intercombination, and offspring of various theories in contention with one another. Various arguments have been made over whether DH represents a colonization of the humanities by computer science or vice versa. Uh, but I believe it's best when it's neither, or rather both, in integration. Uh, so this model DH has implications that tie back with the earlier points that you made. Uh, so for example, don't assume you can just get funding to find a tech person, have them do the little bits and you just do the scholarships. If the tech person and the tech determines what you can think about and express digitally, and the tech person is unfamiliar with the sort of humanistic inquiry you're interested in doing, this is going to be perilous. Uh, you should start by doing what you can by yourself anyway. This actually goes for both uh, those who identify more with the digital side or with the humanities side, as well as those who claim uh, neutral ground between them. Uh, because doing this will expose you to unfamiliar theory, and trying to match it together with the pre-existing theory will force you to confront your own assumptions. Uh, the developers are smart enough to understand what you want, and you are smart enough to understand what they do. However, starting out, neither of you may understand either. Communicating your mental model of what you want to achieve and what you believe is achievable is laden with theory and assumptions about the nature of the problems you're talking trying to solve. Agreeing on what you want and what you want to do can be even harder. The environment does and should constrain you. This means developing any really new thing is usually going to be much harder and take much longer than you expect, but also carry much greater risk. Exactly. Uh, developing any new thing will involve that conflict and revision of theories and tools, which is going to take a long time. Uh, so I'll conclude with a small selection of quotes, which I hope are illustrative of some of my perhaps more contentious points on the nature of tools and theories and the relationship in digital humanities. Uh, this first one is uh, from an old article in The Yorker, probably at the dawn of when people were thinking about this kind of thing, its relationship to uh, computers and uh, humanistic inquiry. Minds unduly fascinated by computers carefully confine themselves to asking only the kind of question that computers can answer. 
Uh, next one is actually from a physicist and mathematician. Uh, the tools we employ at once extend and limit our ability to conceive the world. Then Albert Einstein, whether you can observe a thing or not depends on the theory which you use. It is the theory which decides what can be observed. And uh, philosopher of science, color, Karl Popper, I tried to bring this home the same point to physics students in Vienna by beginning a lecture with the following instructions. Take pencil and paper, carefully observe, and write down what you, you have observed. They asked, of course, what I wanted them to observe. Clearly, the instruction, observe, is absurd. <laughs> so, now I'll pass off to Josh. For, <laughs> for absurd. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, we want to close with um, a few words about some recent developments at Duke, which we hope provide one possible model for a way forward um, uh, for research in this space in digital plastics and beyond. It's certainly not a silver bullet, but we think it heads in the right direction. As of July 1st, 2013, the three of us comprise a research group embedded in Duke University libraries called the Duke Collaboratory for Classics Computing, or DC3, uh, named after the airplane, um, which was built quickly without a prototype and called a loose collection of parts flying in formation, um, a spirit which we aim to emulate. Um, and a machine whose longevity was owing at least in part to its simple and flexible design. Our mission at the DC3 is essentially threefold. First, uh, stewardship of the technical and social structures uh, that we build under IDP. Second, research and development with a view to building standard services and tools that support a wide range of scholarly activities aimed in the first instance uh, at classicists, but developed with a view to much wider applicability. And three, teaching and outreach around these very same activities. Uh, we do maintain independent research lives, but we work together, we spec together, we build together, we present together, we aim to publish together. Starting next year, we will even teach together, which is going to be either a nightmare for us or our students or both. Um, <laughs> we collaborate closely with partners at Duke, in the library and outside of it, uh, with other classics and non-classics projects around the world, though we're just starting out. I now have a joint appointment in the library, uh, the first such academic department uh, appointment in the library at Duke, where Ryan and Hugh reside full-time as, I believe, the first two full-time research positions inside the library. Startup costs are eased with the generous support of the Mellon Foundation, but beyond an initial proving period um, to which all such units are subject, we are hard-funded, hard-wired. This is an expensive proposition, but many good things are expensive, and the returns are already looking like they're worth it. This unique arrangement means that in the first case, we are freed from the grant cycle, and freed also from the hierarchical model of faculty innovators and library or IT service providers. We can play around with things on our own, and as soon as they start to get messy, turn to each other for help. We have the time to let ideas grow, blossom, start to mature, and then erupt in flames. Perhaps rise from the ashes again, perhaps not. We have the freedom, in other words, to fail, and the time to learn from that failure. We are in each other's hair, which means that there is no magic or all. We are not on a first date. We are married. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, what there is, is just the respect that is born of regular, prolonged, close, collaborative contact between smart people in lots and lots of talking. We dream plenty. Coffee, our own espresso maker, and six whiteboards helps an awful lot. But then we do. We live in the real world. We've built an environment that supports thinking and developing at the productive intersection of different mental models. And because we are permanently uh, housed uh, in the university, we're able to evolve with the broader DH environment as we have to, to drive change where we can and must, to take the strategic long view about what to invest our time in, to take the time to find that sweet spot where our different views of the world complement each other rather than clash. Now, this doesn't mean that every digital pro uh, process project, when starting up, has to envisage an operation like ours. This would be ruinous. Um, but we all ought to think and design, as we try to do, uh, with a view to the future, with the strength of our multiple diverse and complementary skills and interests, with a goal of meeting real, definable scholarly needs, 
with a spirit of bold experimentation, and this is important, with a clear call for institutions to furnish the support, understanding, and incentives that make all of this possible. This is a tall order, but it's our view that this period now in which we inhabit is our 19th century. This period now is the time for us to lay the foundations for what and how a complete thriving digital classics ecosystem should be. And in the first case, what the DC3 uh, aims to be is a kind of living experiment in trying to do just that. We'll happily each take one third of a question. <laughs> <laughs>